Well, some of you may remember a few years back, there were those really popular rubber bracelets that many Christians were wearing, and on the bracelet it said WWJD. How many of you remember the WWJD bracelets? Okay, I, I used to have one myself. And if you don't know what we're talking about, WWJD stood for What Would Jesus Do? And the bracelet was a great reminder for us Christians throughout our day to think, what would Jesus do in this situation? How would Jesus react here? What would his position be? And although those bracelets are no longer in fashion anymore, I think it is a really good thing for us to still ask ourselves, what would Jesus do here today? So for example, what would Jesus do about those children that have been separated from their parents at our nation's border. Would Jesus support it? Would he protest it? Would he ignore it? Would he blame the parents of the children? What would Jesus do? If I went out and asked Christians in America that question, we'd probably get a lot of different answers. And that's the problem with WWJD. The problem with WWJD is that Christians in America have very different ideas about who Jesus was and what he stood for. There are some Christians in America today who when they close their eyes to pray to Jesus, they see a guy with blonde hair and blue eyes who speaks English and is a flag-waving patriot. None of those things are true about Jesus. He was not white. He was not English. He didn't even know America existed. And he wasn't even a Christian. Scripture tells us very clearly who Jesus was. He was a dark-skinned, Middle Eastern Jew. He was a refugee. And he was an enemy of the state. Jesus wanted to bring about a new kingdom, a new world, a new world order, a world without borders and divisions, a world where all people are welcomed and accepted, where all people are equal and free. That's who Jesus was. And that's why the state had him executed. Jesus wanted equality, freedom, and justice for all people. And that's what we're celebrating this week, July 4th week, those same qualities. Equality, justice, freedom. It's why our founding fathers and mothers came here in the first place, to found this country. They came here because they wanted to be free. Free from what? Free of persecution. Free of a ruler king. And they wanted freedom of religion, meaning freedom to practice whatever religion you wanted or no religion at all. And they wrote a beautiful declaration of their independence in which they stated there are three inalienable rights the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Which means in the United States, we are to be a place where everyone can live how they want to live, love who they want to love, express themselves as they want to express themselves, worship how they want to worship, and have the right to pursue whatever it is that makes them happy. And that's why I find it so interesting why there are so many people in this country today who proclaim to be patriots and yet they want to deny freedoms to people based on how they live, who they love, or where, or, or where they worship. These so-called patriots, they want to ban people because of the country they come from or because of their religion. These so-called patriots want to deny wedding cakes to gay people. 
These so-called patriots, they want to have up in a public courthouse the Ten Commandments. And they want to have in front of City Hall at Christmas time a nativity display. And they want to have prayer in public school. But what they forget is that that is not what our country was founded on. These public institutions are for all Americans. And Americans come from all different races and religions and faiths. And there are Americans, proud Americans, who don't believe in God. America is for all. America, my friends, is not a Christian nation. It was never intended to be. John Adams, who was our second president of the United States, he said, the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. And our founding fathers, people like John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, they were not church-going Christians. Thomas Jefferson, the guy who wrote the Declaration of Independence, he had well-worn copies in his bedroom of the Quran, the Muslim holy book, and of the Bhagavad Gita, the Hindu holy book. But Thomas Jefferson had little use of the Bible. In fact, Thomas Jefferson famously cut up a Bible. He just cut out the words of Jesus and he pasted them in a blank journal. And he said, these are the only words of use in the Bible. He threw the rest away. That copy of the Quran and the Bhagavad Gita and that journal, which is now known as the Jefferson Bible, all three of those are on display in the Smithsonian. Now, despite all of this, there are still so many people in America today who equate being a good American with being a good Christian. And they say, well, it says in God we trust on our money. And in our pledge we say one nation under God. Our founding fathers didn't come up with that. Those words were added in the 1950s. That wasn't that long ago. Many people in this room were alive in the 1950s. That's when those words were added to our currency. That's when those words were added to our pledge. And they were added because it was the time of the McCarthy trials, when people in America were being tried for being unpatriotic or un-American. And those people who were being tried were foreigners and journalists and intellectuals and artists. It is very important that we remember that history because right now in America, there are so-called patriotic American Christians who are working very hard to deny rights and freedoms to people because of where they live, what their religion is, who they love, or how they worship. That is not American. That is not patriotic. Now, there are some who say, patriotism means America is the greatest country. We're number one. But if you think that we're number one, then you think that everybody else is below you, beneath you, inferior to you. And that's in direct opposition to our being created equal. The Statue of Liberty has a poem that welcomes people to the United States, which reads in part, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And in Scripture, God says, The foreigner among you must not be mistreated. The foreigner among you must be welcomed as if they were native-born. You must love them as your own. God said that. So welcoming the stranger is a part of our American tradition. It's part of our faith tradition. 
And if we claim to be followers of Jesus, well, those were his very own words. He said, welcome the stranger in your midst. And yet most of us grew up fearing the stranger. And that is why it's important for us at this time in our history to remember Jesus' command. Now, one of my favorite Christian writers of all time was a man named Henry Nouwen. I see some heads shaking, so I know there are other Henry Nouwen fans out there. Henry Nouwen wrote beautifully that we have to move from what he said was hostis to hospice, which means from hostility to hospitality, from fear of the stranger to love. And he wrote beautifully in one of his books this statement. He said, The movement from hostility to hospitality is hard, and it's full of difficulties. Our society seems to be increasingly full of fearful, defensive, aggressive people who are anxiously clinging to their property, and they're inclined to look around their surrounding world with suspicion, always expecting an enemy to suddenly appear, intrude, and do harm. But our vocation is to convert the hostis to the hospice, to convert the stranger into the guest, and to create a free and a fearless space where all people can be together and experience the oneness. That is our vocation. I love that. I really do believe that's our vocation as Christians. That's our calling. It's what Jesus called us to, to love one another, to see the oneness in everyone. Which brings me back to the WWJD rubber bracelet. Because I think it's quite clear what Jesus would do about those children at our border right now. I think it's quite clear what Jesus' position would be about cages and border walls and travel bans. It's in Scripture. Jesus was an enemy of the state. Jesus spoke truth to power Jesus called out the political leaders and the religious authorities of his time. If you read the Gospels, he got up in their faces and he called them hypocrites. And when Jesus saw injustice, he got angry. Did that make him unkind or uncivil? Yesterday, all across the country, massive crowds, thousands of people gathered all over to speak out about what's happening at our nation's border. And if you watched the news yesterday, you may have seen that one of the speakers at the rally in Washington, D.C., which, by the way, the crowd there was six times as large as the crowd at the inauguration. But one of the speakers there was one of our UCC national leaders. Her name is Reverend Tracy Blackman. We're so proud of her. We're so proud of the UCC president, vice president, and national officers because they have been so courageous. If you get our weekly newsletter, I shared with you the message that the UCC put out this week. And I'd like to read just a little part of it for you this morning. They wrote, The evils of racism and Islamophobia have been given fertile breeding ground by an administration that seeks the solidification of power with the targeted separation of the other. As people of faith, we understand that there is no other. We understand that the immorality of such acts and that they're not made righteous by the legalization of them. In such matters, we stand with the teachings of our sacred text. We stand with God, who is the God of all. A little over 50 years ago, while caged in a Birmingham jail, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King penned these words 
to white Southern Christian pastors who were uncomfortable with his public outcry for justice. Reverend King wrote, one has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. The national leadership of the United Church of Christ believes that bigotry in the name of national security will not make us more secure, but less so. We're closing the door to our neighbors who are fleeing violence and persecution, and our faith calls us to do otherwise. Our faith calls us to do otherwise. If you're a Christian, you cannot be silent right now. I know that many of you are fans of the Christian pastor and very popular blogger whose name is John Pavlovitz. John Pavlovitz, by the way, I'm excited to announce, is going to be speaking right here in October at Douglas UCC. We're very excited about that. But in his blog this week, John Pavlovitz said, if your church this Sunday is silent about what's happening, go find yourself another church. And here's what he wrote. Our country is experiencing a real-time human rights emergency generated by our elected officials, many professing to be pro-life and claiming faith in a dark-skinned refugee Jesus while allowing migrant families to be ripped apart and children to be housed in kennels. And they're quoting the Bible while they do it. If there was ever a time when the Christian church should be visible and vocal, it should be right now. If there was ever a moment where moral leaders were made for, it's this one. If there was ever a day when spiritual leaders should stand bravely in front of their congregations and speak the hardest of truths, it should be this one. Every pastor, priest, and minister should be standing before their congregations this weekend and specifically naming the atrocities that are happening to migrant families. They should be explicitly condemning these violations against people supposedly made in the image and likeness of God and calling their congregations to do the same. If your faith leader cannot find their prophetic voice to defend children who are caged like animals and isolated from their parents, are they really worth looking to for guidance on how to live out one's faith? to know God's will, or to emulate Jesus. Powerful words, but true. It's not a time for us to be silent. You know, we come here each and every Sunday to remind ourselves of the way of Jesus. We hear his words every single Sunday. And what we're supposed to be doing is taking his words and living them out in the world. So what we should be doing is we should be awakening to this truth and we should be experiencing spiritual freedom. So my question for you on this July 4th week is this. Are you free? Are you free from fear of the other? Are you free of fear from people who look differently from you, who love differently from you, who come from different countries, who practice different religions, are you free of that fear? Are you free of blind patriotism and nationalism? Are you free of Christian doctrine that has been imposed on you that you've never questioned? Are you free of society's very limited understanding about what it means to be a man or a woman or a Christian or an American? You know, the spiritual life, the spiritual path is all about freedom. It's biblical. Moses led the people from slavery to freedom, and Jesus promised salvation. What Jesus meant by salvation, that word, it's, it's a word that has a lot of complicated meanings to Christians, but very simply what it means is freedom. When Jesus said this is the way to salvation, he meant this is the way to freedom. He said you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. 
And what was the truth? The truth was, all of us are one. We're all the same. Love one another. You are one with one another, and you are one with God. And the more of us who awaken to the truth of that oneness, the more we will set ourselves free, and the more we will heal this land. In our gospel and on the front cover of your bulletin today, it tells us that we have been given healing powers. We have. We can heal this land. That's what we were called to do. That's why we were born during this time, is to go heal this land. And we can do it. That's why I don't want you to be in despair. I don't want you to feel hopeless like many people felt this week. I promise you, there are far more people who are working for equality and justice than there are people opposing it. We were born for a time such as this, and we are the ones that we've been waiting for. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you.